How should investors be positioned in a Fed easing cycle, which sectors have tended to outperform in the past? So what is coming up next? Thomas Hayes is here to break down his outlook. He is a managing member of Great Hill Capital and the author of a great finance um, newsletter called Hedge Fund Tips. Links down below. Uh, you should check out. Thomas was on the show a few months ago, back in July, and he told me, if it's indeed true that 2% is a fantasy, even for the U.S., are you saying Thomas, that the Fed is likely to cut before the core PCE gets down to 2%. I think it's at 2.6 now. 100%. I mean, nothing in life is 100%. I'd say 99%. I'd say if you take that bet a thousand times, 999 times, you're going to be right. Maybe this will be the one in a thousand where you're wrong, but I'd take that bet over and over. He got that call right. So congratulations on another, yet another great call. That's been a, you've been on a great streak all year. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you so much, David. Uh, grateful to be here. So uh, let's talk about um, what happened this week. So the Fed cut by 50 basis points. The market started rallying uh, the day after, which was yesterday. On Friday, today on the 20th, where uh, stock markets are taking a bit of a breather from yesterday's rally. I was looking at uh, stats and uh, let me just flip over to my screen here. I was looking at the historical performance of the S&P 500. 500 in the past cycles when we had uh, Fed uh, the Fed cut by 50 basis points. So here's the S&P 500. I'm going to overlay this with the uh, Fed funds right here. Uh, the Fed cut in 2020, March 2020, uh, by 50 basis points. That was uh, here. And the S&P immediately fell shortly after. Uh, well, that was because of the pandemic, of course. In 2008, yeah. it was a similar issue. Actually, the Fed cut uh, right uh, around uh, uh, here. Uh, yeah. by 50 basis points. And then that was during the financial crisis, right before the Lehman collapse. And then in 2001, same story, it was right at the cusp of the tech bubble bust at the time. And so the question remains whether or not we are in a similar precarious situation, which necessitates a 50 basis point cut, because in each of these scenarios in the past, we had a basically a big decline in a subsequent six months after a 50 basis point cut. What's your outlook here? Yeah, I think uh, you, you could go back one more and take a look at 1995. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then you could go back to 1982. So sure. as you as you go back uh, through history and particularly yeah. that double dip there, uh, yeah, recent recent yeah. yeah recently for sure it's had a negative impact. However, if you look at March of 2020. Uh, the market bottomed on March 23rd, and and I and I happen to know that because we got quoted in March 22 saying we were in the market starting to buy stocks, mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of put me on the map and put the podcast on the map and everything else that everyone said that saw that market watch because everyone thought the world was ending and we're like no you know <laughs> let's take a look at some of these companies that are marked down and uh, that cut uh, you had one of the biggest rallies in the shortest amount of time right. from April through the end of the year now. Um, 2008, 2001, yes, those were, were bad situations. And I think that also goes for if you look at the returns of the stock market following the first cut 50 or otherwise throughout history, those cuts that where there was no recession in the first 12 months versus when there was a recession in the first 12 months, the, the returns are completely different. And, and on balance, no recession, you're in the mid-teens up on the S&P uh, in the first 12 months after the first cut. And those where you had the recession skewed overall returns down because when you did have a recession, the returns were abysmal, despite the cut, like, like the two instances that you just pointed out. I think given where we are, GDP now at 3%, uh, it hasn't been a perfect indicator or a predictor, but it's, it's, a, it's a barometer, let's put it that way. Uh, and earnings growth expected to be about 15% next year. It's very hard to get to a recession with that level of growth. And considering you need two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth to define a recession. And I think what continues to fake people off, usually you get a recession once every four years. What's got everyone sideways and why none of their models and, and, and forecasting is working is that we've actually had two recessions in the last four years, both in 2020 and in 2022, when you had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, which they didn't formally declare a recession because they uh, some accounting for the labor market was uh, stronger at that point. 
but it does it is the a negative technical recession so effectively if you pulled forward uh one recession that should have happened over an eight year period i.e one every four years and we've had two in four years the runway looks pretty good and the runway looks good particularly because the only thing that could have destroyed it was powell screwing up which he was close to doing everyone kind of knows in retrospect uh, some of us were prospectively saying, but let's say in retrospect that he should have cut over the summer when the Bank of Japan was hiking. And uh, uh, you basically had a liquidity mismatch. And, and I was really looking out for today with the Bank of Japan. I thought that was very important that the Fed cut 50 basis points because while the Bank of Japan was expected to hold pat, which they ultimately did, if they had gone 25 and the Fed had only gone 25, I think you would have seen close to a repeat of what we saw in early August when the Nikkei crashed 25%. With 50 basis points from the Fed, if the Bank of Japan had done 25 is what I was very curious to see how the market would absorb that. The fact that they did zero uh, and held pat for the time being tells me that we kind of have some support here Despite the seasonal tendencies, worst two weeks of September, uh, pre-election uh, weakness is historically the case since 1955, uh, that may be overcome. You know, I, I think, and I'll talk about what how we've been thinking about it this week, but I think quite a few people are positioned for trouble before the election. And given the fact that the market is designed to fool most of the people most of the time, uh, I'm coming to the view that maybe it's less trouble than most people expect. And the big surprise that would catch people, a lot of people off, off guard, uh, if you look at uh, options skew and other things where people are really expecting bad things, uh, would be if the market actually moves higher into the election, which would go against all historical data and how people are positioned and their outlooks for the next six weeks. Before we continue with the interview, I want to tell you about another way you can invest your Bitcoins and store them safely instead of using a traditional wallet or an exchange. Consider an IRA. Today's sponsor, iTrust Capital, is one such IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1% only. And being an IRA, it also offers unique tax benefits. If you'd like to get started and learn more, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below or scan the QR code up here. If you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, you can do so using my referral link. And if you use that referral link, you'll get $100 in signing bonuses. Wait, so when you say that people are positioned for more trouble and I guess you mean more volatility up ahead before the election, are you saying that we have a net short position um, in futures right now? Yeah, well, here's how I would look at it. So on Tuesday, going in with the same framework, that this would be odds are, you know, worst two weeks of the year are, are the last two weeks of September historically. Uh, in a presidential election year, you get a lot of volatility in September and a flush in a lot of volatility in September and a flush in late October before the election clears. We started looking for, okay, number one, could we harvest some cash to be able to buy the weakness, potential weakness in October? And there was nothing in the portfolio that we felt was exuberantly valued where we would want to get out of the position to raise cash. All the cash that we were going to raise, we did in July uh, when some of the Mag 7 were, were just humming along uh, and late June when, when uh, NVIDIA was doing their split and everyone loved it at 139. Um, so, so not only could we not find enough good ideas to harvest cash because we didn't want to sell them at, at these levels. We don't think they're near fair value or fully valued. But we went through you know, a couple thousand stocks looking for ways to hedge the portfolio, i.e. put on shorts uh, or index hedges. And the only fat pitch shorts that we were willing to put on that made, that made sense from uh, different things we were looking at in terms of fundamental analysis, in terms of technical analysis, they were all defensives, meaning everyone has crowded into defensives, consumer staples, utilities ahead of the fall. So right now, you're so overweight defensives relative to discretionary, people are positioned for bad things. So the last thing you want to do is short defensives into a potential turbulent period. 
And the fact that so many people are already in defensives and positioned for a turbulent period tells me we may not get as much turbulence as people think. So I'm less looking at futures commitment of traders that I would normally look at. And that's a great go-to. And it's, and it's uh, astute that you brought that up as the first thing to look at. But uh, VIX is still a little bit elevated here, which tells me hedging premium is expensive. Uh, so, you know, sometimes the worst case scenario for people that are that are high conviction on either the thing going down or going up is that the market grinds sideways into the election. That would probably cause the most pain to the most amount of people. Uh, actually, uh, since you brought up, yeah, let's talk about sectors now uh, before we get on to the uh, central bank divergences, which you brought up uh, earlier. So this is the S&P again in the bar chart. The purple line is the XLP, so consumer staples um, ETF. It's been underperforming all year still. So um, is that mostly just because of the tech outperformance, you think, Tom? Well, tech waiting, but but look at the look at the hockey stick move it, you know, while from August through mid September. Yeah. And th this is what I'm talking about when I say right, people do, are positioning. Do, yeah. So, yeah, over the last three months, it's just been on a tear. You're right. Let's go up. This is the uh, last three months here. Yeah. Yeah. It's up so, 6%. So, so, SP is up. Go ahead. Yeah. It's up 6%. SP is only up three. So, yeah. So it's, it's doubled the performance. And that's kind of how I'm thinking about And if you actually go back to, to uh, before the Fed cut, it was up eight and change, right? So just go back two days. Oh, two days, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see that peak on the red thing? So it's up about. Um, Hang on, let me go. Back. Oh, I see what you're doing. A couple of days here. Yeah, right so, there. Right there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So it was up another two percent. So it's like up eight percent. So yeah. everyone who is positioning for whatever, what is all known which is the worst two months of the year on average are, is late September, uh, uh, presidential election year since 1955, you know, tend to be really, really choppy and very big weakness into the end of October before the election mm -hmm. clears and, and the thing rallies. So I didn't want to short defensives. I didn't want to short tech into the hole. So basically, we're just standing pat, fully invested, low to no leverage. And if we get weakness, we'll find some cash to buy stuff. Uh, and if the market power is higher, we'll take advantage, which could be a, a real surprise. If the market did push higher into the election, which I'm not betting on, but I'm also no, I'm not also, despite wanting to, not betting against, um, that would probably uh, surprise a lot of people. And, and there's a tendency of the market to do that. Why did you bring up the election several times as a turning point? I mean, what fundamental difference would there be for the markets if, let's say, we had a Harris versus a Trump win? Zero provided that we get a gridlock outcome. So if Harris were to win, it's probable that the Republicans control the Senate, in which case none of the market bad things can happen, i.e. unreal taxing unrealized capital gains, which is the most ridiculous thing ever if you want uh, an economy to flourish. I mean, you would destroy all incentive for people to invest in businesses. Uh, it, it's worrisome that someone would have advisors that would even broach such an idea because it would be so devastating. And they're saying, well, it's only for a hundred million dollar people. You just don't, yeah. i.e. the people that create all the jobs would be disincentivized to grow companies because you can't keep reinvesting if you're taxed before you realize the gain. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Leaving so I, that aside. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And it, it, Trump's not full of good ideas either. Okay. He's got a lot of good ideas as far as business friendly, and uh, I, I'm making no judgments about social friendlies or personalities or any of that. Um, he's more pro-business. He's more anti-regulation. So in theory, the market should like that more. I will tell you that if the Repub Republicans won the presidency, the Senate, and the House, that's not good historically for the stock market, no matter what people think. Uh, just as if the Democrats won the presidency, the Senate and the House is not good for the stock market. The best case scenario, whether Trump or Harris wins, is that the other party controls either the Senate or the House or both. And the name of the game is the market prefers if politicians can do very little. The less politicians can do, the better business will do, the better markets will do over time.
I actually I spoke to somebody who uh, is in the know uh, on the um, unrealized capital gains uh, proposal, which, uh, by the way, Congress has not approved or it, it probably unlikely going to approve. But, um, uh, but according to our calculations, only about 10,000 individuals in the U.S. would be affected. Uh, entities like hedge funds like yourselves would, would not. We're not going to tax unrealized gains from uh, LLPs and BlackRock for, or, or any of that sort. So perhaps it's not that big a deal, even if it were to be implemented. But that aside, Harris wait, wait, has- wait, wait, wait. Let, let, let me just okay, let me, sure. let me let stop here because it's right. such an important, like I can't overemphasize how bad an idea this is. Like if yeah. I was going to write a book called How to Cause a Great Depression, chapter yeah. one would be entitled Start Taxing Unrealized Capital Gains. And you say it's only 10,000 people. How many public companies are there that matter? 2,000 that matter? 6,000 total? So yeah. let's just say the ones that really matter to people's uh, 401ks, retirements, pensions are 500 companies. Let's just be simplistic. So those 10,000 people control a material amount of those 500 companies. And if they are forced liquid liquidators with no ready buyers on the other side, because who would be the ready buyers? People who would also get hit by the unrealized ta- capital gains and have no incentive to create that, that market liquidity. Uh, you're going to have hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of jobs destroyed because you, you are old enough to have lived through what a liquidity uh, dearth of liquidity looks like in the great financial crisis, that would be amateur hour compared to what would happen if this was ever implemented. Well, let me just ask you, suppose it were to affect your fund, suppose legislation were to be hypothetically uh, implemented such that your fund would be taxed on an unrealized capital gains basis, would you move offshore? Would you, would you, would you just leave the U.S.? Uh, I'd probably retire and go play golf. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that settles that. Yeah. Um, this aside, though, so taking the unrealized capital gains uh, discussion aside, Harris wants to raise top capital gains tax to 28%. Um, what- okay, that, look, that I can live with. We've been to that movie before. We've been as high as 35%. In the short term, it would be bad for earnings, so the market would... would uh, <laughs> What was the word that Powell used uh, the other day? Realign or re, re uh, what was the magic word he used? Realign or readjust or reconfigure. Anyway, we could deal with that. We dealt with 35% capital gains. Not No bueno, but not a, a life ender. It would not destroy the economy. Uh, I Taxing remember- un- unrealized capital gains would unequivocally do that, even if it was limited to 10,000 people that control yeah. 80% of the stock. <laughs> Okay, so capital higher cap, higher higher corporate taxes is okay, even though we may see lower margins and uh, maybe slower spending capex. Yeah, bad idea, okay. but but tolerable. All right. Uh, on the Trump side, I remember in twenty well throughout twenty sixteen to twenty twenty, every time he announced new tariffs, the markets just threw a hissy fit. So yeah. I'm guessing capital markets don't like tariffs. Um, have things changed now that we're more adjusted? We've had eight years of tariffs, basically, and sanctions. Yeah. Another less than ideal solution for a complex problem. So let me be fair and uh, uh, criticize both sides, I guess, is the answer. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, both sides have some ideas that are sensible. And I, I don't want to make this a political talk. We're, we're trying to keep it to markets. Tariffs. Trump has historic, Trump is a pragmatist by nature, okay? So he's not an idealist. And, and, and the ideologues are the most dangerous type of politicians because they're making decisions on the basis of a, a zeal and a philosophy and a framework uh, that may or may not be proud. Trump is kind of a deal maker. He'll put out these huge ideas and say, we're going to tax everyone 100%. And then when it comes down to it, uh, he kind of plays the crazy card to get people to the table. And then he cuts a deal that he thinks is in the interest of the U.S. people and creating jobs and putting America first, et cetera, et cetera. Is he, is he perfect? No. Is it, a, is it a practical way for a New York City real estate developer to go about implementing policy? Yeah, that's the framework that he used to build his business over time. And it worked uh, uh, on balance for him over, over many years. And I think it's, it's an okay way. The market uh, is used to taking people at their word. So when you say we're going to put 100% tariffs, it's like, 
wow, that would really be a bad idea too. Uh, almost as bad as unrealized capital gains. Uh, so it does get worried. But I think after dealing for four years with Trump and knowing he puts out these grand claims and then he tries to get to a practical solution and more often than not does, uh, I think they would take it with a grain of salt and let him work his process. Are you looking forward to just the market stabilizing, uh, if not rallying shortly after the election, just on the back of certainty for what we know? Basically, we yeah. know who's going to be president now. We know what the uh, you know administration is going to look like. Some certainty is good. Yeah, I think unequivocally, if we get gridlock and we have mixed government, no, not one party controlling all three branches, uh, we get that that rally. Uh, as far as the indices, though, <clears throat> when you have inflation in this four to five percent range, uh, excuse me, uh, when you have uh, uh, rates in, in this range, four to five percent, et cetera, if you look at multiples over time, we're kind of in the sweet spot currently where multiples have actually averaged 22, 23 times. As as the um, as rates go much lower, which implies growth may be slowing, demand for capital may be slowing, the multiple contracts, or as rates go much higher, which implies there's inflation and that type of thing, multiples contract like the 70s, you had single digit multiples because you had high rates, which was fighting high inflation. Um, but we're in the sweet spot where the market can actually sustain a uh, 21 to 23 times multiple, but we're kind of knocking up against that. So to your question, does the market rally after the election? I think a lot of companies rally after the election, but it may not be those seven that are the most heavily weighted within the index. They'll, they'll do fine, but I think that trend that started in July that we've talked about on, on our past visits together persists. And, and all that means is Margins are contracting because of the spend for the MAG-7 on AI and servers and all that stuff. Their earnings growth has dropped from 50% down to the high teens, whereas the other unmagnificent 493 that had negative earnings growth uh, not only turned positive earnings growth in the most recent quarter, but that accelerates up to mid-teens over the coming quarters. So a lot of companies that are still down and out are going to be doubles and triples, even if the indices have subdued returns that don't look like the rear view mirror of double digits. Maybe they look like high single digits, but monstrous amounts of money could be made in small caps. Monstrous amount of money uh, could be made in value, which out outperforms growth in the first six months. Small caps outperforms large cap by 11% in the first 12 months after the first cut. Um, and um, the 50 basis point cut really will help a lot of small cap companies refinance and raise capital and uh, continue to, to grow earnings. So I think that is a long answer to a short question. Yeah. It's nuanced, indices up-ish nicely, but not bigly, I guess, uh, 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 dovetailing off our, our last segment. Sure, sure. And um, uh, under the surface, opportunities like we haven't seen since 2002 to 2007 Emerging rally markets is rally is going to be huge, <laughs> right? huge, but but seen only under the surface. If you're just sitting in passive index funds, you're going to be like, oh, OK, it's OK. Things are going up ish, uh, but it's not going to be boom. But yeah. if you're saying, look, this is what performs best after the first cut. I want I want some small cap exposure. I want some emerging market exposure. I want some value exposure. Those things that haven't worked for the last decade, if you're in those, you're going to be smiling so wide you could eat a banana sideways. Okay, so to sum up, you you, you like uh, small caps for now. Not so sure about consumer staples, which we talked about earlier. Any oh, sectors speaking of consumer staples, if you yes. look at the Bank of America Fund Manager Survey okay. this week, the exposure to staples relative to discretionary is so stretched right now. So I think, and you saw it last night with the change of the CEO of Nike, for instance. Nike is an example of those discretionary stocks that are left for dead. Starbucks, in a lesser extent, left for dead, uh, starting to get change. 
uh, Lululemon, we, we don't own any of those three, which is why I'm telling you about those three. Lululemon, some of these companies that have been, been smashed because everyone's convinced this, the consumer's dead. Um, the consumer's not dead. We've seen retail sales, and now they're over time. The interest rate environment is going to become going to become more favorable. I also think we're going to start to see in the next twelve months. Uh, there is so much untapped home equity again. I think we could see the HELOC game turning back on. The consumer. Uh, leverage is at historic lows. It just collapsed off the pre-great financial crisis highs. There is so much room for credit expansion. And I think that's going to drive a multi-year expansion, at least into the next decade. That that means what for investors? We should be basically more cyclical in our in our positioning. We yeah, that that's that is the framework that we're looking at. And I think a decent an- analog would be. 2002 to 2007, where tech started to underperform. I don't think tech crashes like it did back then. I think it just underperforms relative to those groups that have performed less well. So I like cyclicals. I like discretionary. I like small caps. I like emerging markets. I like value over growth in the near term. Um, And there's so many quality companies available that are marked down 50 plus percent that are going to be doubles over the next three years. But how do you feel about bonds uh, in the last segment of our conversation? By the way, uh, I'm looking over at, uh, let's flip over to my screen one more time. Uh, This is the CME Fed Watch tool. And all the way to June 20, July 2025, the market's pricing a significant probability of um, the Fed funds rate hovering anywhere between 275 to 350, which is you know considerably lower than what it is today. Uh, first of yeah. all, what do you feel about this projection um, or expectation, and how is it going to affect the bond market? This is one that I think about a lot, David, and yeah. I I think that. Those expecting the Fed funds rate to get to three quickly are going to be disappointed. I'm glad they did the front load because they were behind the curve. I think they're 200 base. They were 200 basis points too restrictive, and I also think that the inflation numbers are going to be bumpy for the. Next. I mean, we, you know, we're we are creatures of recency bias. I mean. Uh, I haven't looked at crude today, but whatever it is, hovering around 70. I, I think that's a temporary, not a permanent issue. I mean, you could wake up tomorrow and the Chinese government could announce a massive stimulus because they're behind the ball on their 5% target. And all of a sudden, crude goes to, you know, goes up 10% in two days because people start to expect greater demand. And um, and then all of a sudden, that energy in the input costs of all of the materials starts to go up and people start to say, oh, maybe we're not going to 2.2%. Maybe we're going to 3.4% inflation. And the Fed's not going to start to re-hike per se, but they're going to slow it down. So I think uh, uh, unless the labor market gets weaker in the next two prints, I think we're going to move to a regime of 25 basis point uh, cuts from this point forward. And they're going to be spaced out. And it wouldn't shock me if the terminal rate is higher than 3%, maybe it's mm. three and a half, maybe I, I wouldn't say four, but I would say high threes. And that's not bad news. That's good news because it means soft landing was achieved and the labor market didn't blow up and we got the mid cycle adjustment correct and, and we're reaccelerating. So that's where we're, what we're thinking about right now. That also supports all of the groups that I've talked to, to you about that we're interested in and invested in. Uh, so just as you know, you've seen the Fed Fund future go from expecting seven cuts when we got none to now, you know, to then expecting none and we got a 50 basis point and, and then now expecting this. I think it goes in extremes. I think the cuts will continue, but I think they'll be slower and smaller than the market thinks right now. And right, that's, so- that is a positive thing for the economy and the market. I'm going to flip over to the uh, 10 year now. Um, and I want to just take a look at how it's been behaving. This is the 10 year and let's just chart it over inflation. So um, if you take, I think you know where I'm going with this over the last, what happened here? Okay. So over the last basically 40 years, there's been, 
uh, a relationship. I don't want to call it a very close correlation, correlation, but a relationship between the 10-year and the inflation rate. Um, given your outlook on the macro, you just talked about the labor market and inflation stabilizing around uh, 2.5% right now. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to the 10-year and ultimately bonds? Okay, so we had been massive bond bulls uh, from uh, – from for some time and we've gotten a rally and i think now we're going to get a counter trend move i.e our our framework had been bonds up yields down that's worked and that was a very unpopular view just a year ago uh and that's been correct now that everyone is starting to say buy bonds uh i think we're going to get a counter trend move i think yields are going to go up in the short term not crazily. We're not going back to five or anything like that on the 10-year. But I think a four-handle, it wouldn't shock me in coming months uh, before we resume the, the, the downtrend in, in yields for some time. So, you, By the way, do you expect corporates to, uh, to do better now that we have a lower rate, lower chance of default? Y yes. Yeah. I think spreads are going to narrow as that, as that window... Actually, high yield spreads blew out a, a hair uh, in, in recent weeks. I think now that markets are getting comfortable that the window is reopening for companies, quote unquote, with distress, i.e. small cap companies to refinance, uh, corporate bonds should do well. We don't really traffic in that area, so I don't want to make any like calls on corporate bonds. But as far as the 10-year yield, our short-term view, which... We don't trade on short-term view. We, you know, we tend to hold older companies two to four to five years unless they perform way faster than would would be expected. In which case, but uh, that that's a champagne problem. Um, I think you get a counter trend move. I think you probably get a counter trend bounce on the dollar. The trend for the dollar is lower. Uh, again, that was another thing that we were contrarian on. It's proven right. It's gotten weaker. Now that everyone's getting on board with that view, I think we get a contrarian uh, short-term bounce, strengthen the dollar, and um, and a short-term rise in yields. The antithesis of what everyone's expecting, you know. Oh, when the Fed cuts, rates will go down. No, what the Fed actually did on Wednesday, and we said in our podcast on Tuesday, I said I didn't think it was probable that they would cut fifty percent. But based on what I was looking at, I said it was plausible that they would. And on the basis of that, people would expect yields to go lower. They would go higher. And the reason they would go higher is because 50 basis points at this time dramatically increases the odds of a soft landing and a growth reacceleration, which favors cyclicals, which favors small caps, which favors value. Um, and what I was looking at in terms of yields being compressed and staples and utilities, you know, utilities are up 50% as a basket since last fall. And now everyone wants utilities. I said, there's going to be a counter trend move. Those were the only like shoot in a barrel shorts, which we're not going to short defensives into a potential period of, of vol volatility. So how can the market cause the most pain to the most amount of people? That would be a counter trend move in yields, which means utilities would go down uh, bonds would go down, yields would go up. Why? Because now that utilities are up 50%, everyone's chasing them. No one wanted them 50% ago in the fall of last year. So I think that's the, that's the trend. And if that's the trend, it's hard to see a scenario where you have a monstrous drawdown in equities ahead of the election, even though the probabilities would favor weakness into the election. I think too many people our position for that, and the market doesn't reward when everyone's crowded into one trade. It tends to punish that. This particularly it tends to punish the Johnny Come Latelys, and there have been a lot who would never be getting into utilities three months ago, all crowded in now that they're up 50%. Final question, I'll let you go, Tom. Uh, on central bank divergence, which actually we started with, let's close off on that. So like you pointed out, central banks around the world kept rates and changed uh, this week. Would this pose a risk uh, in the next coming months? Suppose we continue to get this divergence with the Fed cuts by 25 basis points, like you said, um, or even 50 in, in some extreme cases, but other central banks stay pat. Wouldn't that induce capital flows out of the U.S. into Japan or any other place that has r relatively higher rates now? That will be 
the trend over time. I think the trend over time, it, over time meaning intermediate term, 12 to 24 months, is weaker dollar bonds rally over time. I think the short term counter trend is stronger dollar next few weeks, uh, yields out next few weeks. But looking out a few months to more than a few months, uh, you'll resume a, a downtrend in the dollar. You'll resume a uh, bid in bonds. That all favors the groups that we've discussed so far. Uh, and and the stage is setting for the for the area that no one wants to touch, which is emerging markets. And we've been pounding the drum, but you know, sooner or later, these frameworks they repeat themselves over and over and over. And the conditions are set; the table is set right now. Uh, that's going to be the next thing to surprise people. Just as when you couldn't give away the ten year uh, some time back, and we were pounding the table on that, that that has had a big big rally um, uh, for that instrument. And now that everyone wants it, you get the counter trend move. Excellent. Where can we follow you, Tom? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Hedge Fund Tips. We have a podcast called Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes, which is well ranked in its uh, the hedge fund category. It toggles between number one and number three. And uh, hedgefundtips.com is the blog. Okay, we'll put the links down below. Yes, you've got a great podcast. People should check out Tom Hayes' uh, newsletter and podcast. Great reading and great listening. So uh, thanks for coming back on. Uh, appreciate your updates. And uh, yeah, you've been right all year. Let's see what happens in the next couple of months. You've got a few months left to be wrong. But uh, well, like you yeah, yeah, exactly. We got to keep our humility when, you, when you're on a run like that. <laughs> uh, so that that's the name of the game. That's why we just try to stick to good companies at reasonable prices. And then we play the time arbitrage game. So we don't have to be right up about all these zigs and zags. But <laughs> right. I know you like the zigs and zags. So I'm grateful to be on and talk with you. All right. Well, we'll talk next time about some trades that maybe haven't worked out in your career. That could be a fun discussion. Uh, yeah, thanks, may, maybe a long one too. All right. <laughs> thanks, my thank friend. You. And have thank you for one. watching. Bye -bye. Yeah, thank you for watching.